Welcome to SEMCAST from the campus of Concordia Seminary, St. Louis. I'm Dale Meyer, and I'm glad you've joined us. In this SEMCAST, we're going to speak with one of our fine students here at Concordia St. Louis, Mr. Grayson Grenz. And we're going to learn about Grayson's life, how he came to the seminary, what his hopes are for the future, and some of the, the joys and the, the less than joyful things that he addresses as a student. Grayson, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, do I assume now that you spend about 18 hours a day studying and I really pulled you away from your books for this SEMCAST? Um, not quite, but mm. close. Okay. Well, you're, you're a diplomat. You'll do well in, in parish ministry. Let's go back to the start so that students, uh, so that, that our SEMCAST viewers get to know a typical student. We've done a number of these shows before. And I'm always glad to have you get to know one of our students. Where'd you grow up? I'm originally from Denver, Colorado. Um, my parents uh, were a uh, physical therapist and an architect, and they sent me to Lutheran schools uh, starting in first grade. And I grew up within the church and had a lot of fun doing it. Um, went to a Lutheran college, became a... Well, let, let, me, let me stop in Denver. What congregation in Denver? St. John's is my home congregation. Uh, my family has since switched to Christ Lutheran uh, on Franklin Street. And I've been, been to St. John's. I've been to St. John's. It's a big congregation. It was a great place to grow up. And what school did you go to? I went to Denver Lutheran High. Uh, I also went to the grade school at St. John's. Okay, Denver Lutheran High. Was Mr. Palmreuter the superintendent then? Uh, executive director, yes. Executive director, that's the title. Well, Ken Palmreuter is a, gr a great guy, and I first met him on my vicarage congregation in Lincoln Park, Michigan. He was the principal of Calvary Lutheran School, and I was a lowly vicar, and, and I learned there to uh, have a high regard for Ken and wife Martha, and, and he's still doing well. So you went to... Denver Lutheran High School, and then, before I interrupted you, you were off to the grand life of college. Where did you go to college? Concordia River Forest. Uh, well, I guess it's Concordia Chicago now. It will uh -huh. always be RF to me. Uh -huh. Well, you have the RF Chicago color on as a shirt, yeah. Not a conscious choice, but... <laughs> what, what was your major? I was a uh, secondary education major uh, with a specialization in U.S. history and a minor in theology. When did you graduate from Concordia, Chicago? Uh, 2000. 2000. All right. This means that you are technically a second career person here at Concordia Seminary. Technically. And it, it's interesting. You, you look at Grayson. Um, you typify a lot of our students. People will say, well, how many second career students do you have? And I, and I think the number is around 50%, give or take. But a lot of them have, have done, what, four, five, six, seven years at a career and then come here. So second, second career doesn't necessarily mean an older, extremely older person. So after you graduated from Concordia, Chicago, where'd you go? Uh, I spent one school year on uh, Long Island in New York mm. at Long Island Lutheran High School. Um, when my wife's job situation changed, we took calls to Rockford, Illinois. Mount Olive Lutheran in Rockford, and I served at Rockford Lutheran High School. Okay. And then I spent one more year at a startup school in Marengo, Illinois, uh, Faith Lutheran High School. Okay, I'm a Northern Illinois boy from home, so those are familiar names to me. You mentioned your wife. Tell us about her. Uh, my wife, Mindy, is a uh, trained DCE. Uh, she's also a Master's of Family Life Ministry from uh, Concordia, Nebraska. Uh, she is a really, really wonderful woman who's been very, very supportive of me coming to seminary, uh, uprooting us from where we'd been for so many years uh, and, and coming down here. When I told her I wanted to go to SEM, she said, well, it's about time. So uh, she's been very, very supportive. Do uh, you have any children? Three, which makes the move even more difficult, but uh, a good move. I have a four-year-old son, Gideon, a uh, two-year-old daughter, Amelia, and a four-and-a-half-month-old baby, uh, Nathaniel. Do you sleep at night? No. <laughs> well, well, good. So, so tell us about the, uh, the decision and maybe the anguish to uproot and go to seminary. The decision was not an over-the-night thing for me. 
uh, I had often had people tell me, you, you should be a pastor. That's really what you need to be doing. And uh, no, I'm not, no, that's, that's too much. No, no. Uh, and so I finally, God worked on me in a, in a lot of different ways and put some people in my life that, that really pushed me. Um, and when I started having kids, I was thinking, okay, this is the end of the situation. It got more and more to be a part of my life that people were pushing me in this direction. What kind of people? Just general people, people that I knew from my, uh, from my work, uh, from my congregation, friends. Uh, I had a very supportive Bible study group in Rockford that, uh, well, most of my kids' godparents come from that group, so we're very, very close. And um, they were always kind of pushing and, and saying, you know, I think this is something for you. I think that's significant because all the numbers indicate the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is going to have a huge clergy shortage in years to come. Now, it happens to be right now that when call day comes, we have about the right number of calls, usually a little bit short. But you talk to the insurance people, and there's going to be a lot of retirements coming up in the years ahead, mine included, and we need the pastors. And, and it's the people that you talked about, congregational people, your, your, your pastor at home, those are the best recruiters for our future pastors because you see, I'm talking to you now who are viewing SEMCAST, you see the qualities that are needed in pastoral ministry from the people that you have around your congregation, especially the younger people, and you can encourage uh, and, and do as you, you called it, push. And, and you resisted that a little bit, but eventually they pushed you over the edge. So. Talk, talk more about when you actually made the decision. What was it that said, yeah, okay, I really need to do this? Uh, my job change from Rockford Lutheran High School to, to Faith in Marengo uh, really just kind of set some things in motion that uh, I started thinking, you know, maybe it is time for me to consider this. Not go, but consider thinking about it. And uh, when I got to the school and, and started interacting with some more people, and just had some very, very similar experiences to what I had had at the other The school places. in Marengo? Yes. Okay. Uh, when I got there, they started saying, hey, you know, you should think about this. Uh, and they were very, very supportive about it. And when I finally went in and talked to my principal, Bob Schulze, and said, hey, uh, I'm thinking about this, his first remark was, great, go for it. If that's what you want to do, do it. And uh, that really freed me up uh, to, to think about it more seriously. And um, over a Christmas break, my wife and I prayed and talked to family and friends about it, and we decided to make it happen. Uh, it also made it easier for me to make the decision uh, when I found out about the alternate route, certificate route program here. Okay, let, let, let's, let's back the truck up a little bit. I, I, I had two questions. One question I was going to ask, now you've given me two questions to ask. What kind of interaction did you have with Concordia Seminary St. Louis as you were debating this? And then secondly, you need to tell us what the alternate route is, okay? Uh, I really didn't have a whole lot of interaction with Concordia Seminary while I was trying to decide what I was going to be doing. Uh, whether or not I would intend seminary. Um, it was not until after I'd kind of made the decision that I, that I called up the seminary and said I'd like to come. And they made it very easy for me to, to get down here and visit and see what things were like. And uh, it felt like the right place to be. Uh, my wife and I commented when we were done with our visit, um, this, this is a good fit. Okay, so the, the visit was helpful. Oh, yeah. Very, definitely. very helpful. And, and we often have potential students coming onto campus who are, who are checking it out. Maybe they haven't made the commitment that Grayson and, uh, and his wife had made, but, but they come down here. So again, talking to you who are viewing SEMCAST, if you've got s some young person in your congregation who you think has this fit and, and seems to be interested, by all means, we're glad to welcome to the campus and talk to them about the realities of ministry. We're not just going to sugarcoat this stuff. We're going to talk mm -hmm. reality. Okay, so, so you had kind of worked that through before you came to the visit. The visit confirmed what you were thinking. Now, explain to us this alternate route thing. The alternate route is a program for uh, people that have been serving in the church, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, for at least eight years or are 35 years of age. Uh, and they can come and do a, a slightly shortened program, uh, and it leads to ordination uh, and I really enjoyed that idea because uh, I didn't want to uproot my family too much. Uh, moving to St. Louis from Northern Illinois was not easy to do, but it was something that needed to happen. 
but when I found out that I would be going to uh, seminary for three years rather than four, and really only moving my family twice rather than more than that because of vicarage. Did I explain that? How does a vicarage work for an alternate route student? I actually have what's called a convertible vicarage, where my vicarage becomes my first parish. So I will serve them as a vicar for one year, and then after ordination will stay there and continue to be the, their pastor. Are you also designated to go back to Northern Illinois if they have a place for you? From what I understand, they try and place you in an area near where you've come from because you'll have ties to those communities. Um, I'm not so sure I go back and forth week by week if I want to go back to Northern Illinois or see where the Lord puts us, but uh, it is an option, and, and I think it's a good plan. It's one of the things that I think is really uh, significant is that when a student comes here, there's no guarantee that you're going to be placed in the church. I mean, it's kind of implied, and that's what we want it to be, but, but, but these students are coming and saying, here I am, Lord, and I hope you, through the church, have a place where I can serve. It's, it's just not a, a, a guaranteed situation. But I, to the extent that I've gotten to know you, Grayson, the church will have a place for you because your abilities are there. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to affirm what the people who said who pushed you in this direction said. Thank you. Now, so we've got alternate route. Help us understand what other routes towards service and pastoral ministry does Concordia Seminary offer? Uh, there's also the MDiv program, Masters of Divinity. Uh, Concordia Seminary also has a master's uh, program uh, through their graduate school. There's also the deaconess program for uh, female students. Uh, there's the mission plant tract, the missionary tract, all sorts of different ways where people can uh, find their niche and, and find a place to serve within the and these are the resident, you're right, excuse me for Residential students, you. yes. This is what we, I stepped on your line, as they say in broadcasting, and that's my fault, I shouldn't do that. These are residential programs, and then we have our contextual programs, like the specific ministry pastor program, which has just been introduced, the um, Ethnic Immigrant Institute of Theology, the Deaf Institute of Theology, the Delta program, and that's winding down, and the Center for Hispanic Studies. So the point of this being that there are all sorts of ways to enter ministry through Concordia Seminary St. Louis, and it, a, a way that will fit the prospective student. When I came here, dare I say this, young guy, it's up to you. I started here 40 years ago, and as I remember, there was only the one, one way. Our church needs different ways, and, and the seminary is provided those for people, uh, especially people like me, second career people that, that feel God's call but are a little hesitant to go the traditional route. Okay, now, now you're here, you moved down, you have 10 kids, I think you said. Oh, I mean, uh, three. In, in 1969, I came here with no wife, and most of the entering class didn't have wives. As some guys did, and as the years went on, they kind of fell off year by year. Um, no, no children that I recall. Maybe there were a few, but it was, it was a totally different, different world. What are what are some of the things at seminary life that turned out as you expected? What have some of the challenges been? Um, we really expected for this transition to be uh, a hard thing to go through. Moving your family, doing those sort, sorts of things. Um, it actually has been a lot less of a burden on us than we ever thought it would be. Mm. Uh, the place that we live, the, the Founders Way uh, Woods Apartments, are, are excellent places. Those are married student uh, uh, apartments on campus. Yeah, at, right now we have a three-bedroom apartment, uh, uh, and our two of our kids are sharing a room, and, and it's worked out perfectly. It's been a great place. Uh, what's really nice about it is the community that's there. Talk about that. There's just a ton of other married students, and, and some, uh, some with kids, some without. Uh, most with kids, I should say, uh, that are there, and it, it's, it's kind of a built-in community. And uh, the more you're willing to go out there and meet people, there's no end to the people that you can come in contact with from all over the nation um, with a unifying factor that we're all here studying um, to be pastors in, in the church or yeah. to improve our ability to do that. 
I've got to ask our producer, Dale Ward, if we could turn this all into a mini-series because what you're saying about community may not be registering with you. It, this is extremely important. Again, harking back 40 years when I came here, our class had been together two years for sure, four years in a lot of cases, and in some cases these guys had been together eight years before we set foot on this campus. Community was a given. Now students come from all over, second career, first career, some married, some single, and we actually have to form community. And the reason why forming community is so important, more so than ever in the past, is because when you're out there in the ministry, you know, something's going to happen. You say, my goodness, what do I do with this situation in my congregation? Well, you've got community. Maybe, maybe there's a, somebody that you've gotten close to over, over your seminary years. Whoever you call them and say, hey, Fred, I got this situation. I don't know what to do. You know, there was a time when I thought I knew everything. I don't know what to do. What do you think? And that community. And, it, and, and community came naturally 40 years ago. But we're really, and, and, I, and I hope you'll testify to this, that we in the administration are trying to do the things that create at least the possibility of community of students because you're going to need it later on. Yeah, and, and there are those things. Um, there's the family nights where we can eat in the, uh, in the cafeteria with the, with the dorm students. Uh, there are events uh, like Oktoberfest, Springfest. Uh, there's also a group for the ladies on campus, the, the Seminary Women's Association, uh, and they put on all sorts of different things. Uh, my kids this year really enjoyed the Christmas pr uh, party, uh, birthday party for Jesus that they threw. Uh, there's just a ton of different things that you can get involved with. There's intramurals, there's student government. Uh, if you're willing to go out and, and try something, there's an opportunity here to, to be a part of something and, and to get to know people. And uh, I like it in the woods. Uh, probably maybe the least planned, but the best way that it happens. Uh, when the weather is nice, every week, Friday night, there's a potluck barbecue in the woods at, at, near the playground. And everybody comes out, brings food to share, and you stay as long as you can or until your kids need to go home. And it's just a great time to get to know people. And that's one of the benefits of the residential program as opposed to our contextual distance learning programs that, that hey, you bump into somebody here, and that's not going to happen quite the same way uh, on the computer. And our, in our distance-based contextual programs, like SMP, turn out good pastors. It's not that. But there's something about being there. In fact, Daniel Alshire, president of the Association of Theological Schools, wrote a book once about being there, and he was heralding the virtues of residential program. Okay, now we talked about this. How, a quickie is how you found the studies? Uh, challenging. Challenging. I, I wouldn't say that they are um, easy by any stretch of the means, but they're always appropriate, and they always seem to have something that is that is shaping and forming uh, me to be the pastor that I need to be. Um, it's not always easy. I wish there was less reading and less homework, but I taught for eight years. So I'm. <laughs> I know how that feels. So it goes around, comes around. Do you find through your studies that the faculty is actually getting into your heads and starting to make you think as a pastor? They, they pose challenges to us and questions that, that we have to deal with, and, and uh, they are things that we are going to need to be able to explain and talk about in our, in our ministries. Um, what's awesome is they do it in such a loving and caring way that, uh, you know, I feel like uh, I, I could go and ask them just about anything in terms of, what was going on um, and I know that other students have told me they call them up after they've left saying you know professor what do you think about this I know I teach classes I try and teach one or two classes every quarter because I enjoy teaching and once in a while you see the guys looking back at me so why are we having this discussion and and I'll say listen there's a reason why I'm telling you the story about what happened to me in my parish ministry because in some some way shape or form it's going to happen to you now, one of the things that you and I have talked about, Grayson, is financing this education. Would you share with the, with the people who are watching SEMCAST how, how, edu how financing the education is a burden today? That It wasn't 40 years ago when I got here. It, it is an expensive proposition to come to the seminary. Um, the funding for the seminary is, is basically uh, 
kind of up to the students. There is not as much of a subsidy as there used to be in our synod for the seminary, uh, but there are a number of things that, that they do try and do to help you with that burden. Um, like I said, it's not an inexpensive thing, uh, but it is well worth it. Uh, I myself have been very, very blessed. God has provided for my family in incredible ways. Uh, several congregations have stepped up and significantly uh, helped me with, with funds, uh, so much so, so that this far in my uh, seminary education, I haven't put in any of my own money, which is not necessarily the norm. Uh, for me, I'm a little bit more of the exception, uh, but it has been just a tremendous blessing. The Lord does provide, and He will provide in, in a lot of different ways. Let me, let me back the truck up and say a couple of things, and I appreciate all that you're saying. First of all, there was a day going back to when I entered the seminary, when um, the budget of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod provided a good chunk of the seminary's needed revenues. And we're, gonna sh we're showing you now uh, on the screen um, a, a listing of how that, call it subsidy, from the budget of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has gone from a 44% uh, down to where now it's about 2%, okay? And I gotta, I gotta hasten to say, that that's not because the, the, the Board of Directors of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod doesn't like us. They just don't have the money. The goodwill is there, and if they, if they had the dollars, they would. So the subsidy has declined. One of the places where, where that has, has been dealt with, in some ways, unfortunately, is that tuition costs have gone up. And now we're just, tuition is not just the only expense you got, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you've got books, you got, you've got your housing, food, and the thing with a family with how many? Fifteen three. kids? Three, three kids. <laughs> I'm just teasing you there. You, you've got all these other expenses. So more and more in these past years, the burden has been shifted two places, to Concordia Seminary as an institution. And, and frankly, we are basically a self-funded institution. We have to find our $24 million every year. And part of that has gone into the, the, the rise in, in your tuition and other costs. That's not just a seminary. Public education has, has the same experience. So what we're doing here is saying, yeah, there is a need. And if I remember what you, you said, Grayson, people have stepped forward to help you in your situation. And that's true for, I think, all of our students that people have stepped forward with their gifts. The seminary is stepping forward as best we are able to with our grants and our scholarships, and we're getting through this. Is there anything that I've said that's wrong? Mm -mm, no, not at oh, all. You're a, smart, you're a smart student. But the, but the result is, and this is what we want to communicate to you as you watch this SEMCAST, that our students are carrying a heavier burden than a generation or two ago. And I think sometimes, honestly, doesn't it weigh on your mind you worry about things? Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, it was a huge consideration in, in deciding to come here. What would it cost? Because I still had undergraduate loans. I had been out working for eight years, but still had undergraduate loans. Uh, and so looking at what it would cost and what I might be needing to take in loans was a big deal. Uh, several students have talked to me about needing more subsidy, more, f more uh, funds coming in. Uh, they're willing to take out loans to become the pastors that, that they feel they are called to be. Uh, but still, taking out loans is not maybe the best way that we could do it. Yeah, now, now somebody's going to say, hey, that's the way it is in academia today. You take out the loans and then you repay them when you get out there and, and have a real job making money. Well, having worked as a Lutheran Church Missouri Synod uh, commission minister as a high school teacher, um, it is not the most high paying of jobs to work for the church. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you get tomato and zucchini in season. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, you, you, there are a lot of ways that the Lord provides. And uh, my wife and I saw that when we were um, working as a youth minister and as a high school teacher. Uh, we never made $50,000 a year, but we found ways and the Lord provided when we needed uh, that extra help, the money that we would be able to use. Um, so. Yeah, people will say, you, you signed on the loans, you know, go ahead and pay them back. It's not as easy as that sounds when you're working for the church. Yeah, you're not going to become a lawyer or a physician pulling in, in six figures. It, one of the things that is true is that the districts of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, and our district presidents 
our congregations realize that this is an issue. And in a good number of districts, there are loan programs to help you repay. I've heard of congregations where the congregation steps up to the plate and helps deal with the student loans. So I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged. The seminary is dealing with it. The church at large is dealing with it. And the purpose of the SEMCAST here is, among other things, to let you know what the situation is with funding theological education. But the big purpose of this is to meet a student, meet a student. Grayson, if, if you're going to summarize your seminary experience to date for our viewers, what would you say? Wow. Um I think it would probably be uh, the word blessing. It has been really, really good to be here. It has been a <clears throat> blessing to my family with the people that we have met. It has been a blessing to me in the shaping and forming that's happening for me. Um, you, you're saying a lot right there, and you have to know, and I hope you know this. I know you know this. I mean, you don't see me every day, and you don't see all the professors and administrators every day. But we love our students. We really, really do. And we want to be faithful to the charge that's given, been given to us to bring them through and prepare the best students, pastors, deaconesses, that we can for the church. And we're working at this. And I thank you for joining us at SEMCAST to show your interest in, in, in preparing these under-shepherds for your congregation and other congregations in the years to come. If you want more information about Concordia Seminary, go to www.csl.edu. Feel free to write a letter to me, um, and we'll do the best we can to answer it. But thank you, thank you, thank you for your interest in the Lord's work through Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Uh, thank you, Grayson, for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you on our next SEMPcast.